Okay, so my previous unit was going over waves, right? Now, what were our two types of waves? Remember from our last unit, we had two types. No, there are two types of waves. Oh, longitudinal. Longitudinal. And transverse. And transverse. Those are two types. Now, we focus on transverse waves mainly, right? On the EM spectrum. Well, compressional and longitudinal or sound waves. So that's what we're going to put our focus on this unit. Our essential question, how is the velocity of sound wave affected by the type of medium it is traveling through? We'll pick up on that in a second. Um, but first, as a quick refresher, remember this slide? We had our longitudinal compressional, which is what we are focusing on. Okay, sound waves. Um, instead of our wave unit, which we mostly focus on light waves. Okay. This is also important when we're talking about velocities. Okay. So, what was our velocity of light? Three times ten to the eight. Okay. So that is. If we look at that. Um, that's three with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight meters per second. Sound, on the other hand, travels through air at 343 meters per second. So you can see the difference here, the great difference, light travels significantly faster than sound, right? But let's look at the trend here. We have air, and it says at 20 degrees Celsius. Now, depending on the temperature of the air and the humidity, this will change a little bit, this 343. But for the most part, we're just going to stick with uh, traveling through air, then it's 343. Water, however, is 1482. Seawater is 1522. And steel is 5960. So what's happening here? Are velocities increasing? Why? It gets more dense. Okay? This all has to do with density. So, as the density increases, what happens to our velocity? It also increases. So the denser material, the faster the sound travels. Now, do not confuse speed with volume. Okay? How fast it travels is different than how loud something is. We're just talking about speed, velocity. Uh, this one mile equals 1,600 meters. We're going to be using that in some conversions. That's why you need that. So what type of relationship is there between density and velocity? Directly proportional. That's right. So if I was talking about two whales speaking to each other, what velocity would I use? Seawater. Seawater, 15.2, right? Mm -hmm. So here's my analogy for why that is. Okay, we have two scenarios. You guys know what a bucket line is? No. Right, all it is is a line of people that transfer a bucket of water down the line from the water source to the fire. 
Okay? In this case, we have two scenarios. We have three people in this bucket line. We have eight people in this bucket line, the bottom. What do the people represent? Okay, more specifically, though, what do they represent? What? The molecules. Yeah. The particles that make up the material. Okay? So these guys are the particles that make up the whatever material we're talking about. So this guy has three molecules and this has eight. What does the bucket of water represent? The sound. The sound wave. Yeah, the energy of the sound wave. So which scenario is going to be faster? Eight. Or top or the bottom? Bottom. Bottom. Why? So it has the most molecules. Okay, it has the most molecules. So think of it, it's a lot easier just to turn it from one side and hand it to the, the left, right? Go from right, left, right, left. Instead of this guy on the top, he's going to have to, in the water, run over to this guy. This is going to have to run over to this guy, run over to the house, and then they're going to have to all run back. Right? It's going to take longer for the top to transfer the sound wave across. Okay? It's the same thing. So the more molecules there are in the substance, the closer those molecules are to transfer that energy from one to another and then down the line. Okay, our equation that we're going to use for velocity is the same as we used in the previous unit. It's velocity equals frequency times wavelength. Now, in our cases, we are going to know the velocity, right? How are we going to know that? Find the medium. Okay. So, on these, more than likely, you will be asked to calculate either the frequency or the wavelength. Because you'll know the medium just by whatever medium that's traveling through. What did we say the relationship between frequency and wavelength for us? Between these two variables? When wavelength increases, what happens to frequency? They direct. When one goes up, the other one goes up? No, it goes like this. Inversely? Yeah. Proportional? Yeah, remember on our EM spectrum, and along the top we had our wavelengths getting bigger, and the bottom, the frequencies were getting smaller? So they are inversely proportional. This is important when we're talking about our sound wave distortion. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, so let's actually draw some sound waves. What do they actually look like? How are we going to represent sound waves? Well, it depends on the source. If we have a stationary source, okay, something that is not moving, that is making a sound, then we're going to have these rings come off of the source. Right? And for each of these um, diagrams, you want to make a little sketch of it. So this is a stationary source. Now, what would we call the distance between each ring? What would that be? Silence. The wavelength. Yeah. The distance between each ring is your lambda, your wavelength. Now, if it is not moving, what can we say about the wavelengths for each of these rings? Yeah, they're all the same. Okay? So in a stationary source, your wavelengths are going to be all the same. So draw a simple diagram and make sure you label it stationary source or not moving or stopped, whatever you want to do.
however you want to label it. So in this case, no matter where you are, whether you're on top of it, in front of it, behind it, all of the sounds, all of the sound that is making are going to sound exactly the same, right? Now it might be a little bit quieter depending on the distance you are, but it will sound the same. Which brings us to our moving source. Stationary source. Okay, now if we have a moving source, okay, our source is moving from left to right. Look what's happening to our wavelength. What's happening in the front? Our wavelength is decreasing. What happens in the back? Yeah, so we get some distortion going on. We get a short wavelength in the front, long wavelength in the back. What happens to the frequency in the front? It gets higher, right, because there's more waves per second that's squished. And behind the source, lower. So if you're standing in the front of this object, it's going to sound different than if you're standing behind that object, right? The frequency is going to be different, so we can say it has a higher pitch in the front, a lower pitch in the back. What if you are traveling with the object? Will be a high or a low pitch? Traveling with it, what do you think? Uh, you're traveling. Say that's a police car. And you are traveling in the back of the police car. Um as you're going and the siren's on. Okay, are you gonna perceive a change? Is it gonna be higher or lower? It's gonna stay the same. That's right, because you're traveling with the source. Okay, everyone have this drawing? This is a moving, moving way, or moving source, pardon me. You can call this moving source number one. this up and we have these two observers we have observer in the front they are hearing high frequencies compared to our observer in the back which are going to observe low frequencies as an example Welcome to the Adler Scientific Society. Which consists of him and his three kids, apparently. The society. Most people have heard about their death. They might not know it from the long experience. Let me show you what I mean. I. Love. Same thing with the train yeah. traveling by, right? So the funny thing is that when you're in the car, it doesn't sound the same. So you got to listen.
listen to that right now. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Here we go. <laughs> So inside the car, what should we hear? Say, right? There was Nathan Kennedy video. He was the first one. Okay, this time we're going to do the experiment one last time. This time we have the walkie talkies on, so we're going to be able to hear the car going by. We're also going to be able to sound that feedback in the car, so we can figure out what's really happening. So he's going to play buzz, so it's a little bit hard to hear, but one of them is going to stay the same, and you can hear the shift. At a certain point there, they are exactly the same, right? Yes. Yeah. Feel bad. <laughs> Here's the difference. The sound from the horn was different when you were standing watching the car go by compared to when you were inside. And that's really what the Doppler effect is all about. It's an apparent change in the sound when either the object's moving or the observer is moving. The sound doesn't change. That's pretty important because scientists can use the Doppler effect in radar to figure out what kind of storms are coming. Uh, they can use it when they look at stars to tell us the universe is expanding. So it's a pretty important phenomenon. Hope you learned something and then you enjoyed it. Thanks very much. This was the Adverse Science of Society. Thank Take it easy. <laughs> okay, so it's important what he said at the end there that this is just an apparent change. The sound itself doesn't change, right? It's just a perception is what's changing. So, what is this called? Moving. The what? Moving signs. The Doppler effect. Oh, all right. Is this the change in frequency is what the Doppler effect is. Okay, the apparent change in frequency. Where if an object is traveling towards you, you're going to hear that high frequency. If it's traveling away from you, you're going to hear low frequency. If you are traveling with the object, it's not going to be a change at all, right? You're going to get the original Okay, so now what we're going to do is speed up our source. Going to get it going a little bit faster. You ready for that? Okay, the faster the object is traveling, the more distorted we're going to be. Okay, so, if this is an airplane, how fast is it traveling? How fast? What? 343 meters per second? How do you know that? Because that's the velocity of sound in air. That's exactly right. So we know that that plane is traveling at 343 meters per second. Now, if you're in front of this airplane, what are you going to hear? Nothing. What are you going to hear? Nothing. Nothing. Because the sound hasn't traveled to you yet. Okay? So, if you think of... Any time that you've heard an airplane fly overhead or a helicopter fly overhead. And you look up to where you think it's going to be, and it's not there. Right? Because that's where it was when it made that sound. But since then, it has traveled way in front. Because it took the sound that long to travel from where it was 
to your ears. That's why when you look for a plane, you have to look way in front, right? Because the plane is actually in front of where its sound has traveled to your ears. Make sense? That's also an indication of how far away it is. If you guys on Saturday, whenever they do the uh, tornado, yeah, whenever they do the tornado drill test, um, if you ever listen to that, at the very end, you can hear them shutting off. But they don't shut up all at the same time, though, either, do they? Yeah, but they actually are shutting off at the same time. All of them are shutting off at the exact same time, but it takes the sound longer to travel to your ear for it to turn off. Okay? So that's a good way to be able to calculate how far away that object is. We'll talk about how to do that. So in this case, this is traveling at the speed of sound. So this diagram is at the speed of sound. So, if this was a fish, how fast would it be moving? Say this was a trout. Uh, 1482 meters per second. Now, there's no way a fish would be swimming that fast, but. Really on? What's next? Which will be what? Faster than sound. So now we have this cone coming off of it. So if you travel faster than speed sound, then you're going to produce a sonic boom. Which is a, an extreme Doppler. Okay. So the point at which you go from moving slower than sound and break that barrier, the sound barrier, to move faster, you have a couple things happen. Number one, you have the sonic boom is produced. Okay? When these sound waves overlap each other. Number two, you have a cone of compression, a visible cone that's basically a cloud forms. So, you have this tremendous amount of pressure, and if you pressurize air, what happens? It becomes denser. Okay, it becomes denser. And say, what if there's water molecules in the air? There's steam. And they'll turn into, they'll condense and turn into what? Water vapor turned into a cloud, basically. Okay? It's due to this pressure. Yeah, just as long as you guys get the gist of what it looks like, you'll be fine. Yeah, and resetting for you.
Um, anyone know who broke the sound barrier to begin with? First person. Uh, he's American. Stop right there. Really, Earhart. Yeah. No, a little bit lighter than her. You guys who flew the plane, Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager. Oh, they named a beer after him. No. No. So these group of uh, um, test pilots. Okay, now. This was right after World War II, okay, and, you know, the air battle in World War II was one of the main reasons why the Allies won, because of just air superiority. And realizing that, the United States wants to build up its air force, right, well, they start, you know, the whole process of building an airplane is someone comes up with the concept, right? They do all the math, they run all the numbers, and then they build it, and then they're going to have to find some poor sucker to get in it and see if it flies, right? Now, they are, obviously, there's a lot of math involved, and this is before computer modeling and all of that. I mean, this is hand-drawn with a calculator, if you're lucky, doing all the calculations of how much lift um, and how much force to take, not only to fly, but they were trying to go fast. Right? They wanted really fast uh, planes and they wanted maneuverable, maneuverable, they wanted light, right? just like cars, except this is inherently more dangerous because these are all prototypes. So these guys would get in them and hope for the best. So this this particular airplane was basically a rocket with rocket fuel. I mean, this is they graduated from propeller based airplanes. And basically a rocket with some wings. Okay? Right. Pretty rudimentary controls, um, pretty small in the grand scheme of things, and it was light and fast. So Chuck Yeager gets in this, and he does a couple test flights, flights just to make sure that, you know, it functions right before they start pushing the envelope. And finally, they do break the sound barrier for fun. It's a huge deal, obviously. And so he goes faster than 343 meters per second and breaks the sound barrier. Now, how do you know? There was a well, Whoa. there's that a visual and obviously the sound barrier being broken, there's a sonic boom. So here's the compression um, see it forming right when the it breaks the sound barrier. So remember the drawing, the diagram of it? It looked like a cone, right? Well, this is visualizing that sound coming off of it. Well, now we just do it like every day. <laughs> what? That was cool. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right, so this first one is just an overhead video of, or a video of a plane going supersonic and just passing. Um, tomorrow, I'll show you the other video, um, which has some slow motion. You can actually see the compression cloud forming now. So on that, you can, for a brief instant, it's too loud, but the brief instant, I'll rewind it so you can actually see. Where are you guys going? Stop moving. You can see the compression platform for just a second. The other video is a lot better at that, but I'll show you.